Can you see my screen? All right. So we were we were taking a particular use case in the previous session, and uh, the focus was ranked retrieval. So what we were trying to do was. So let's assume you have a bunch of documents. And as I said before, documents can be a bunch of web pages, for instance, or it could even be, say, books in a library that are digitized. That's an example of documents. And if you have a query, then uh, one way to construct that query would be to construct it as a Boolean query. So what happens is when you construct a Boolean query, then you, you deal with operators such as and, or, etc. So for example, you could have a query that looks for author is equal to say John Grisham, something like that. And uh, say uh, category is equal to suspense or something like that. Um, but this works when the data is structured or when the query is structured. So in the example that I said, the query itself was structured. And let's say the data is also structured, then the Boolean queries will work. But the fact is, we live in an era where neither is the data structured and we are much more comfortable when we've gone to an era where we are happy to you know, punch in queries that aren't quite structured, they're unstructured. So the question is, how do we go about doing matching queries with documents, retrieve the documents, and rank it? When we say rank, what we mean is the one with the, with the highest match will come on top. And then, of course, the one with the least match will come at the bottom of the heap. So now the way we approach this is we need to figure out what is called as uh, a score. I'm calling it scoring because for some reason they use the word scoring. Score is also fine, so don't particularly worry about it. So we're going to define what is the score mathematically. We'll do that. Uh, the approach that we're going to take is we're going to take these scores as the basis of ranked retrieval. Um, so imagine you have a score. The score is basically a number. So the objective is to come up with a number. Let's call that score. And higher the score, you know, the higher it sits on top of the hierarchy. So if, if the score is, say, 195 as compared to, say, 50, then the document whose score is 195 would uh, come on top as compared to the document whose score is 50, all right? Now, so we'll, we'll come back to defining a document, something that we already did, but let's do it again. Consider the number of occurrences of a term in a document. Each document is therefore a vector. So here are 
a bunch of documents. Clearly, they, they are from the works of Shakespeare. Antony and Cleopatra, Julius Caesar, The Tempest, Hamlet, Othello, and Macbeth. So these are various documents. And these are terms. So what you see here are terms. Uh, so one question for you. Uh, of course, you're not seeing that many terms here, but typically, how would you determine the number of terms? How would you do that? The number of terms. So let's say you have one, two, three, four, five, six documents. Antony and Cleopatra, Julius Caesar, The Tempest, Hamlet, Othello, and Macbeth. These are the documents. Here are terms. Not exhaustive. You don't have all the terms here. But let's say you were to come up with all the possible terms. So how would you come up with all possible terms? How? Just to wake you up. And? What do you mean by and? By using and we can... No, no, you, you didn't understand the question, Abhinav. Okay. My question was something else. How would you come up with this list of terms? Is it that difficult, folks? Uh, take unique, uh, unique terms from uh, all the, uh, you know, books. All the. Uh, all the models or all the documents. Sorry, all the okay. documents. That's right. So when you say unique, what? Say that again. Unique. And when I say unique, like uh, you know, distinct uh, uh, words that are available in uh, each. That document. is right. Correct. That's the best way to do it, isn't it? So look at these documents here. Antony and Cleopatra, Julius Caesar, The Tempest, Hamlet, Othello, and Macbeth. Take all these documents and then come up with a unique list of words that are there in these six documents. And those are your, what is called as terms. What does this mean? So what does 157 mean? Anyone? What does 157 mean? The term Anthony occurs 157 times. That is right. That is right. Okay. It occurs 157 times. So on and so forth. All right. Now, so in this particular case, <coughs> uh, if you look at a document and Let's say I have two documents here. This is a sentence, but I'm calling it a document. John is quicker than Mary. Mary is quicker than John. These are two documents. All right. John is quicker than Mary. Mary is quicker than John. Now, can somebody tell me? Okay, these are two documents. I'm going to represent them as vectors. So can you can somebody tell me how many terms are there? I have to represent these Five two documents terms. as vectors. Five. Five. What are those terms? John is John. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Mugundan. You were saying something. Go ahead. Yeah. Words like John is quicker than Mary. That's right. So there are five terms. Correct. Now. Two documents, so which means two vectors. Question. You understand that these are the count of the terms in a document. I think you understand that. So going by that, are these two vectors the same? Are they the same or are they different? Look at the model. Yes, they're same. Okay, somebody said they're same. Who said they're same? Raji, is it? Tyler. 
Kyle, right? You're right, Kyle. So they are the same. Why? Because the count are the same. So if you take the first vector, John occurs one time, is occurs once, Quaker occurs once, Dan once, Mary once. And if you go to the second vector, it's the same thing. Mary occurs once, is occurs once, Quaker occurs once, Dan once, and John once. But are they the same? No, but, they mean different. Exactly. Entirely different, isn't it? Right? So we already know one pitfall of this model. What is that? It doesn't it doesn't capture the semantics quite well, isn't it? Right? The fact that I mean we have swapped nouns. John and Mary have been swapped. And once you do that, the whole meaning of the sentence changes. We don't capture all that. All right? So that's already a pitfall of the model, but setting that aside. Now, when, when you don't really care about the order of words, so if you, the order didn't really matter, isn't it? Because John being at the start of the sentence, John being at the end of the sentence, Mary being at the end of the sentence, Mary being at the start of the sentence, did it make any difference at all? It didn't. What is this model called? When orders, when order of words don't matter. You've heard this before when we did naive base. What's that called? I'll give a clue. It's something to do with bag. B-A-G, bag. What is it called? Bag of words. Exactly. Why are we calling this bag of words? We're calling it bag of words because think of these words. Let me put it this way. If order matter, think of putting these words into a bag. Okay? If order matters, can I put these words into a bag just like that and you know, shake the bag and take the words out, will I get the same thing? No, I'm not going to get it, right? Because the order would have changed. But then when order doesn't matter, I can happily put these words into a bag. I can shake it up. I can do whatever. I can take things out. I will get the same vector. Because what matters here is not the order. What matters is merely the count. So this is called as a bag of words model. We already know one pitfall that we just discussed. We swapped nouns and we found that the meaning of the entire sentence changed, but uh, the vector couldn't capture it. So let's be mindful of that. But still, it's one step forward. We will see how this whole thing works. Okay. Now, now what we're going to do is we're going to define what is called as the term frequency, TF, subscript T comma D. So here's a term. Here is a term. Think of this as a document. All right. Another document, another document. Think of this as D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, so on and so forth. T1, T2, T3, T4. These are terms. Okay. The term frequency of term T in document D is defined as a number of times that T occurs in D. All right. We'll come to this. We want to use this while computing query document match. We'll come to that later. A typically raw term frequency is not what we want. Uh, what we do is I mean, the premise is a document with 10 occurrences of the term is more relevant than a document with one occurrence of the term, no doubt. But it doesn't mean it's 10 times more relevant. It doesn't mean that. So what we typically do is we take a log, log to the base 10. Okay. That's the usual practice. Uh, now, so if you look at 
WTD. It's called. It's basically a weight of the term frequency. Okay, you can look at it that way. Is equal to one plus log of term frequency to the base ten. Now, uh, why one? It's it's to ensure that. I'll give an example. What happens if the term frequency is one? What's the log of one? Zero. Exactly zero, right? Now that doesn't make any sense, isn't it? Because there is an occurrence of that word in a document. So if you say that it has occurred and yet the weight is zero, it doesn't make sense, which is why you add a one there. All right. So what we do here is we we add a one to the logarithm of the term frequency. Okay. If the term frequency is greater than zero, otherwise it's merely zero. Okay. So that's a term frequency, which so in this case, if you want to calculate the term frequency, term frequency is of course 157. I'm talking of the weighted term frequency. Apologies. Okay. WTD is like a weight, which is the log of the term frequency to the base 10 plus one. Okay. Now, now the question is, so you have one, one statistic, not statistic, but I'm using that word for a lack of a better word. I'm calling it statistic. So you have this term frequency. And with that, of course, we calculate uh, the weighted term frequency now if you think about it <coughs> i'm going to ask a question let us say i'm looking at the word the the <coughs> what do you think about the term frequency would it be huge or, or a big number in each of these documents i'm talking about the word the or the whichever way you want to call it yes it will be high in each of them that's right correct it's expected to be high in each of these documents but does that really add value no it doesn't correct so in a way we are saying some of these more frequently occurring words don't add much value. So if a word occurs frequently in a lot of documents, it doesn't add value, All right? Uh, but if certain words occur rarely in certain documents, it might add a lot of value. So, so the first thing we do is we calculate the term frequency and then we calculated a weighted term frequency, WTD. Then what we do is we, we focus on rare terms and that segues into IDF. Segue means it kind of helps us to get into this new concept called inverse document frequency. We'll come to that. Okay, so we have a term frequency. For a moment, forget the term frequency and focus on rare terms. So what we're saying is rare terms are more informative than frequent terms. So should words such as A and carry a lot of weight? Evidently not. So consider a term in the query. So let's say I'm, I'm running a query that has this word arachnocentric okay arachnocentric and if there are 20 documents okay if there are 20 documents 19 of which did not have even a single occurrence of this word arachnocentric and there is only one document in which this word arachnocentric occurs 
would we and 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 my query has that word arachnocentric would i pull out the 19 or would i pull out the one which one would i pull out Ninety. Think. I have a query. So imagine yourself to be a searcher on the internet. You're looking for pages with the word arachnocentric. That's the word that you're looking for. I, God knows what that means. I have no clue. But whatever it means, it's certainly a word that you haven't seen, I haven't seen. Okay? At least most, I believe most of us haven't seen this word ever. But the fact is, I'm going to search for this word. So I, I go to Google and punch in this word, arachnocentric. Now Google does this, you know, it does its search. It locates 20 documents first. Out of the 20, 19 did not have the word arachnocentric anywhere in the document. There is one document which had that word arachnocentric, okay? But all 20 had the words like and, the, you know, uh, maybe I, you, all, all such common words were, I mean, occurred in all 20 documents. My question is, what would Google do? Will Google pull the 20th document and show it on top? Or will it show the 19 documents? Where 20th document. Exactly. Now the question is, it doesn't do an exact match. It, it matches the query with the document and figures out a score. You remember we were talking about scoring, scoring, right? While calculating the score, it assigns a high weight to rare words. All right. We'll see how that, how it exactly does that. We'll come to that. But that's what it does. It it assigns a higher weight to a rare word and a lower weight to a common word. So words such as a, the, and, etc would have a lower weight and words such as arachnocentric, nymphocircum, whatever, you know, some crazy words will have higher weight. And the idea is when you run a query that has these rare words, the search engine, the, the whole logic, it could be the, a Google search engine, it could be anything for that matter, would be able to do a good match between what you have given in the query as against what is there in these documents and produce a meaningful result. Okay. Now, let's define a few more words. I'm sorry, a few more terms. Collection frequency of T. T is a term, by the way. A term, a word, it's all the same for us. So don't, don't really worry about it, okay? So the collection frequency of T is the number of occurrences of T in the collection of documents. Document frequency of T is the number of documents in which T occurs. Read it again, and I'm going to ask a question. Can collection frequency be less than document frequency? No. Why? There's at least one in a document that a third or more than that. So it'll always be greater than the document. There is some disturbance at your end. Someone else, please answer that question. I think it should be greater than or equal to, we see. It we should be greater than. What is it? The term should be greater than or equal to number of documents. Assuming each document no, will no, have wait, at wait, least wait, single wait, word. Wait, wait. What is this term? I'm. We are comparing collection frequency and document frequency. Correct? 
my question was can collection frequency be less than document frequency no why you're right but why we see like are you so, collection frequency is the number of times the word occur in the collection of documents, whereas T is the number of documents in which the word occurs. So, obviously, collection oh, frequency. Well, why are you folks misinterpreting? What do you mean by T? Why are you folks misinterpreting that sentence? What is T here? T is the word, like something. It's, like... a, it's a word, correct. T is a word. Yeah. I, I still don't understand. What were you trying to say? Say that again. So, for instance, mm, I I know you understand. I know you guys have understood it well, but you're not articulating it well. Go ahead, do it again. This way, hmm. for instance, the word insurance, the word insurance would appear number of times in this collection of documents. But the documents in which the word occurred would be less. Why? Did you get it? No, no, but why? So, that's something, how to say. Every, in each document, it can be present many, more than a time. Whereas, mm -hmm. count in the number of documents, it would be relatively less. So. Okay, so. So what you're saying is, if I have 10 documents, the word insurance can occur 10,000 times. Yeah. Let's say insure. Okay. Let me ask this question. The word insurance occurs in e in 10 different documents. In all documents, I will find at least one occurrence of the word insurance. Okay. Yeah. But. In total, the word insurance occurs 10,000 times across those 10 documents. What is the document frequency? 10. 10, exactly. Because it's document frequency of T is the number of documents in which the word T occurs. That's it. The number of documents. Collection yeah. frequency is every time the word occurs, you increase the counter by one. All right. Okay. okay. Fine. So, so understand the difference between collection frequency and document frequency. What we are looking at is the document frequency. All right. Not the collection frequency. And let's see how we use the document frequency to calculate what is called as the inverse document frequency. So DFT is the document frequency of T. T, of course, is a word. And what DFT means is the number of documents that contain T. Uh, okay, don't worry too much about all this. We define IDF, which is the inverse document frequency of T by log of N by DFT. All right. So let's say we assume n is 1 million. And then here is a word, Calpurnia. And if it occurs, and if DF is 1, which means, what does 1 mean then? Tell me. There are 1 million documents. n is 1 million, which means there are 1 million documents. And the word Calpurnia, I mean, I, I see DFT as one here. What does that one mean? Interpret it for me. Out of one million documents, uh, Calpurnia occurred in only one document. Exactly, right? So, and then likewise, if you take the word animal, there are 100 documents in which the word animal occurs. So what do we do? Once we have DFT, we calculate 
IDFT, right? How do you calculate IDFT? You use this formula. It's simple. So 1 million by 1, which is 1 million, 10 to the power of 6. So log of 10 to the power of 6 to the base 10, that would be 6. Likewise, if you take this, N is 1 million. IDF is IDF of animal would be log of 1 million by 100, which is 10 to the power of 4. So this is 4. Now, can somebody help me interpret this last row? What's happening in the last row? Just help me interpret the last row here. The word there occurs in all the 1 million documents. Okay. But it's not a relevance word. So while finding IDF, it becomes zero. Exactly. Right? So, And that's what we want. We don't want... We want to suppress the importance of words such as the, under, etc., and focus on these unique words or rare words such that when you run a query, you can do a match. We'll come to that, how that, exam, how that exactly happens. Okay. Now, let me ask a question. Let us say Google has identified at this very moment, okay, this very moment, Google has identified all the documents that are there on the internet, let us say, okay? And no more documents are getting added. Nobody is punching anything on Google. The internet is static for the next 10 days. No more addition to what is there on the internet. The question that I have is, would each word or each term have a static IDF value? Would each word, Google is, engineers at Google, as I said, you know, they, they're working now they find that the entire internet is static. No new, new documents are getting created. My question is, would each word or term have a static IDF value? Yes. Why? There's no more documents are getting added. Exactly. And the number of times each term occurs. Take. They're static, correct? So which means, let's say at this very moment, internet has become static. Nothing is changing. And let's say Google engineers figure out that the word Calpurnia occurs just once in one document of the 1 million documents that are there on the internet. So I've calculated an IDF now, which is 6. The IDF will remain static, right? Likewise, the idea for animal would be static. The idea for Sunday would be static, so on and so forth, right? So we can say, if you have a collection of documents, so when I say this, we have a collection of documents, the documents are static, by the way, there is only one IDF value for each term T. Would you agree? There can't be multiple idea of values for each term T. The moment you define the collection, in this case, it's the 1 million documents that were available on the internet, then there's only one IDF value for each term. Term, again, it's a synonym that we use for word, right? Now, let me ask another question. Now, Google, I mean, the, the internet is on now and people have started uh, editing documents. So you can't add a new document. So there are a million documents on the internet. 
people are editing documents they're not adding documents will the idea of value can the idea of value change no we say i don't think so why or why not because it's scaled in terms of logarithm so think 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 and tell me abhinav actually if to tell the words only which are repeating would be for instance the uh, those words will be the adding to the documents and no, no. you, the you, idea you didn't understand you didn't that. understand the question abhinav i'll go again i've opened up the internet again for 10 minutes i don't allow the addition of any new document so which means the number of documents remain the same which is 1 million but i do allow documents to be edited i do allow documents to be edited my question is after 10 minutes is there a possibility of idf changing or do you think that idf will still not change no 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 we see because the documents are not any new documents are added so the df value will remain the same think 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 idf will change the idf may change may why if they remove the word kalpurnia Exactly. Then the DF will become zero. Isn't yeah. it, Abhinav? I can go and edit a document and add the word Calpurnia, isn't it? Yes, yes. So you can edit That, the word. Ah, uh, I said you can edit, right? <laughs> so yes. So IDF can change under those circumstances. All right. So I mean, I ask this question so that you guys are very, very clear. What exactly DF means and what exactly IDF means? I think that's very clear now. Good, good folks. So now. now that we have tf and idf we multiply tf and idf to get a score now we will do a problem for us to understand what exactly is this okay uh, so i'm going to share a spreadsheet Okay, so here's a query. <coughs> Let me make it look bigger. Here is a query. Best car insurance. I have two documents: document one and document two. Uh, I I was assumed n to be ten past six, which is one million. All right. Now I'm going to calculate the scores. So a score. Think of the score as what you do is a score is calculated. Okay, one way to calculate scores, we know it's TF into IDF. Okay, that we know. So if you go to the deck, you have a TF, you have a IDF, you multiply the two. But then we were talking of one word, right? So if you look at this, the focus was one word: insurance, try, Calpurnia, animal, Sunday, etc. Of course, typically when you run a query, you'll have more than one word. So what do you do? You do a match so when you take a document you're calculating the score for this document with respect to this query so you do a match and then you you calculate the score so let's let's do this here so here's the query we'll take the document one which is car insurance auto insurance so that's a simple sentence So let's try to calculate TF into IDF. We'll do that. Okay. Uh, there's much more here, but let's just focus on some of the simpler stuff. So what do we do here? I, I've just put in all words here, all terms: auto, 
best car and then uh wait a minute document give me a moment folks did i get this wrong auto best okay yep that's right uh, so here is give me a sec folks auto best car insurance okay All right, let's let's do this now. So we need to calculate the TF. So look at the occurrence of the word auto. So there's one occurrence of the word auto. Uh, best doesn't occur at all. So the occurrence is it's zero here. Car occurs once. And insurance occurs twice. So the next step is, of course, one plus log of TF. So you just take this number, find the logarithm, add one. And then we have DF. Of course, the DF is with reference to the number of occurrences of this word in. in a corpus of documents. So I'm just fixing some numbers here, 5,000, 50,000, 10,000, so on and so forth. Insurance is 1,000 here. So what do we do? We have DF. The next thing is we calculate an IDF. IDF is nothing but log of N by DF, N being 1 million by DF. So this is calculated again. Then what we do here is we multiply TF and IDF. Forget normalized ones. Let's not worry about this. We'll come to that later. So here you have TF and IDF. You multiply the two. And if you want to calculate the scores, you just add these. Now, I've committed a mistake here. What is it? Can somebody tell me? Is this, remember how we, are calc how we are supposed to calculate scores? Look at this. Score of Q comma D, where Q is the query, D is the document, is TF into IDF. And look at this. T belongs to Q, right? Look at this and tell me what mistake have I committed. Forget these two column folks. Forget these two. Okay. But other than that, can somebody tell me what mistake have I committed? Do not consider auto for the schools. Okay. Why? Because the term belongs to query that is only searched in a document. Auto does not belongs to the query. Okay. Anyone else with a different view? We say log n by df for inverse document frequency. Sorry, say that again. For inverse document frequency, we are using the formula log n by df. So yeah, as you said, n equal to one million for best term frequency. Sir, document frequency is zero. So. Ah, okay. So, wait a minute. So, you're saying, give me a moment. Let me edit this. Document frequency is not zero. Document frequency is 50,000 here, right? DF. What is zero is log of TF plus one. Term frequency is zero. Corner three. Did you get that? Document frequency is this column. Sorry. Right. Okay. Now, anyone else with a different view? Mugundan thinks that auto shouldn't figure here. Is he right? Yeah, it's not given in the query. 
Exactly. So what are the three words? Okay, so the query has three words, right? Best car insurance. And if you look at the scores, we're supposed to look for terms that are part of the query. So, so which means auto shouldn't have been included here. It should have ideally been auto should have been zero. Best is of course zero. We should have only car and insurance. Would you agree folks? Right? Why? Because car and insurance are the only two words that are common between the query and the document. All right. So, so this is zero, this is zero. And according to our definition of, I think I have the definition here, definition of weighted TF, if TF is not greater than zero, we just populate a zero here, which is why you see a zero. Okay. And this is, of course, log of, okay, can somebody explain why is this one? Why is the weighted TF one? Log one is zero. One is zero. One. One. Exactly, correct. So log one is zero, you add a one to that, all right? So, so here we have TF into IDF, TF into IDF, you sum it up, that's 5.90, that's your score. That's a score of document one. Okay, now, likewise, forget this bit, I can calculate the score of document two. So let's look at document two. In this case, it is best car insurance, best car insurance. I just repeated the same thing twice, all right? So best car insurance, so two, two, two. I calculate again, at, you know, a TF weighted and then an IDF, and then I calculate a score. And this comes to 8.19, okay? Now let's say I have a document. I'm just gonna add it here. I'm gonna call it document three. Sorry. But document three is just best car insurance, folks. Okay, it's just best car car insurance. So let's let's do this for document three. Now, can somebody help me? Forget the forget this column, normalized and all that. We'll come to that later. So it's best car insurance. So that's document three. I'll just copy it here so that. Can somebody tell me what is a raw count here? One. One. Again? One. One. One, One. One right? <clears throat> Do you see this changing? DF, does it change? Will DF and IDF change? It doesn't, right? Because we are assuming that there's a big corpus, like the internet, for instance. And I've already right. figured out that the word auto occurs 5,000 times, the word best occurs 50,000 times, car occurs 10,000 times, insurance occurs 1,000 times, all right? So this doesn't change, okay? Here is TF, IDF. I sum it up to get the score. Why am I summing it up? Look at this, folks. There is a sigma here, right? <coughs> I'm, just, I'm summing it up. I will do the same sum here too, okay? So what was document two? Sorry. Yeah, document two was, let's, let's paste that. It's 
So document two is best car insurance, best car insurance. Document three is best car insurance, all right? So document two had, or rather has, a score of 8.19. Document three has a score of 6.30. All of them with respect to this query, which is, the query is this. Okay, let's understand this now. <coughs> so I have a question. <laughs> I'm punching in a query, best car insurance. <coughs> Google finds two documents, document three and document two. Document three is best car insurance. Document two is best car insurance, best car insurance. Basically, Best car insurance, repeating twice. Google calculates the score. Remember, the score is calculated with respect to a query. Right? And then the document 2 score is 8.19. Document 3 score is 6.30. Is it right to say that document 2 is a better match as compared to document three? Now we're ordering, you know, you run the query on Google. You punched in best car insurance and then Google finds out document three and document two. And then Google, as I said, it calculates the score document 2 score is 8.19 document 3 score is 6.30 so should google <coughs> show document 2 first because the score was highest or rather higher not highest higher as compared to document 3 score what do you think what is your intuition Forget the mathematics and all that. What is your mm -hmm. intuition? Document 3 is the perfect fit. Why? For our search, right? Why? This car insurance, best car insurance. But <laughs> document 2 is, has higher frequencies. So Does the frequency even matter here? It doesn't. But that's how it works, right? What does your intuition suggest? But I think intuitively document 3 would be the correct. Okay. Any other answer? Any other thoughts? I guess Google would suggest document 2 to be the best. Since the score is higher than document 3. Score is higher. Hmm. Document 3 score is not higher. It's lower, right? No. Document 2 is, one is higher. Hmm. So, Google may suggest document two okay. to be the best. Right. Anyone else? Any other thoughts? I shall the same thought as okay, same thought. Okay, fine. Now, now, the way to look at this is Google shouldn't care between three and two. It's, it's like saying... I'll, I'll give an example. Let us say I have a book. Let me pick a book. Wait, did I mention that book somewhere? Ah. R.S. Agarwal. Okay. I think all of us know what R.S. Agarwal, who R.S. Agarwal is or was. I don't know whether that guy is still around, but still. Uh, so he wrote a book on quantitative aptitude, okay? So there is one book. So let's say Jaren chooses to take a photocopy or a scan, you know, she scans that book and uploads that in, you know, uploads that to the, to the library, okay? So that's document. D. So document D is 
और डी वन स्कैंड कॉपी ऑफ क्वांटी टेटिव एप्टीट्यूड Now what Madhumita does is, in her wisdom, she chooses to scan the book twice. So it's like you have the entire Ara Sagarwal book, the quantitative aptitude book, scanned, and then she appends another scanned version of the book to the same book. So D two is scanned copy of quantitative aptitude appended. I mean, I'm just calling it into two. Just to what I mean is, you have the book, the entire say you know three hundred pages, then you add another three hundred pages, exactly the same book. All right. Now, now Abhinav comes into picture, and he punches in a query. What does he want? He wants all the documents with the text quantitative aptitude. Okay, uh, let's say the. Name of the author or something like that. Okay, not name of the author. Name of the text. Now this whole search engine. It could be Google or it could be the search engine in your li library application. Should it treat? Because if think about it, <coughs> D two has twice the number of words as D one. Would you agree, folks? If D one has fifty words, D two would have hundred words because it's Scan copied twice. It's it's like your best car insurance, best car insurance, right? So evidently, I think all of us would agree. Or let me pose a question: Which one would have a higher score? Would D two have a higher score, or would D one have a higher score? D two will have a higher score. Evidently, correct. That's right. But do you think your search engine <coughs> should it differentiate between D one and D two? Use your intuition. No, this. No, right? Isn't it? Would you agree? Mugundan says no. Should the search engine differentiate between D one and D two? What folks? But if the search engine uses the score to I, 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 the, my argument is it shouldn't use the score. That's the point. Oh, then how does we'll come to that? We'll come to that. But okay, that's what we're trying to take it step by step. We're saying scores are not sufficient. We need to go a little bit more than that. Okay, we'll come to that. Okay, <laughs> we'll we need to have a different version of the score. Calculated, calculated a little differently, but do we agree that <laughs> intuitively, if as we agree, uh, the scores of D two would be twice the scores of D one, or the score of D one. But in terms of what the search engine should produce, I think we collectively agree that. Uh, There's nothing to differentiate between D two and D one, isn't it? Would you agree, folks? Any yes. right? Okay. Now we need a measure which will help us help us tell that look, yeah, D two is the scanned copy of quantitative aptitude twice D one, but D one and D two are the same. So, what is that measure that will help us do that? That's the question. So, to do that, normalization. Sorry, a normalizing the T T F I D F score. Okay, but you're jumping the gun there, <laughs> all right? 
you're right, but you're jumping the gun. Now, let me explain that a little bit. So, so let us say I I managed to, okay, this is two dimension, but let's say the book, the Aras Agarwal book, I'm just calling that the book, D1, then we two books, D2. So let us say I managed to represent the book as a vector. How do I represent? So folks, question, what are the dimensions of this vector? Can somebody tell me? So if, let's take this case. So let's say, yep. What are the dimensions of document one? Anyone? So I'm plotting oh, this, four. this as a vector, the whole thing as a vector now, right? So what are the dimensions of this vector? Unique words in document. Correct. So don't you see in this case, auto is one dimension, best is one dimension, car is one, insurance is another, right? Four dimensions, right? So against the auto dimension, this value is zero, this value is zero, this value is two, and insurance is 3.9, okay? Likewise, forget the query. All these documents can also be represented as a four-dimensional vector. Now, for convenience, I'm keeping it two-dimensional, but then if this document has 10,000 words, then what will be the dimension of the vector, folks? How many dimensions will be there if the document had 10,000 words? Won't it have 10,000 dimensions? Across each word, you can calculate a TF into IDF, right? You can do that, like the way we did here. Some of them will be zeros, like for example here, auto was zero, best was zero, because there was no match. But in terms of dimensions, there are four dimensions, okay? Now can somebody tell me, how would the vector D2 look? Here is the vector D1. How would vector D2 look? How, how will I draw, draw D2? Double the time. Double the time. So which means what? How will it look? So parallel okay, let's, to D1. Parallel to D1. That is right. And? If magnitude will be double the time. Direction will be in the same direction. Correct. So for example, to make it very easy for us, let's say there are... So this is one dimension, one units, two units, one units, two units, let's say, okay? This is word, say auto. This is a car, okay? Of course, there are a lot of words, but I'm just keeping two here. So let's say D1 had one occurrence of the word car, one occurrence. Okay, this is not technically auto and car. This is TF, IDF of auto. This is TF, IDF of car, okay? You've calculated the product of TF and IDF, and it's one here. So I've drawn a vector like that, okay? Or not, not particularly a great vector. Let me just fix this. So it will look something like this, okay? Now that's D1. So don't you see D2 would be, I would just extend that. 
all the way up to this is d2 because it's we know d2 is nothing but twice d1 now remember what was the objective the objective was to the intuition suggests d1 and d2 are the same right that's what intuition suggests what measure from trigonometry would help us ascertain that d1 and d2 are the same <coughs> cosine cosine because we know if there are if this is theta so i can say i'll calculate the cost the cost theta the cosine of these two if theta is zero then the cost theta is equal to one so we're saying when when these two vectors d1 and d2 are pointing in the same direction then cos of d1 comma d2 is a measure that will be one here correct why because the angle between d1 and d2 would be zero right so what we're trying to say here is what matters here is not the distance between d1 and d2 because yes there is some distance between d1 and d2 what is this distance called folks do you know what is it called how do you calculate distance on the cartesian plane how do you calculate distance so let's say so here's a cartesian plane x y here are two points x1 y1 x2 y2 how do you calculate the distance root of x2 minus x1 the whole square plus y2 minus y1 the whole square okay what is that called euclidean distance it's correct it's called the euclidean Euclid distance why because this geometry is called as a euclidean geometry which is why it's called the euclidean distance all right now the point that i was trying to make is so when you have two vectors d1 and let's say d2 like that the euclidean distance is this isn't it this whole thing now but that is not a measure of similarity it's not a useful measure of similarity here the useful measure of similarity measure of similarity would be the cosine of d1 comma d2 all right so think of d1 as a vector d2 as a vector you got to figure out the cos of d1 comma d2 and that would be the the measure that will tell us whether two documents are similar or not okay now the next question would be how to calculate cos of two vectors d1 comma d2 so let's go to vector algebra so if i have d1 and d2 what are the dot product of d1 and d2 modulus of d1 into modulus of d2 cos d2 okay, cos modulus. of the angle between them modulus of d1 modulus of d2 cos theta correct so can we say cos theta is equal to d1 dot d2 divided by modulus of d1 
into modulus of d2. Can we say that? I'll just split this into two parts. d1 vector by modulus of d1 vector into d2 vector by modulus of d2 vector. What is this, by the way? Modulus of d1, what does it mean? Magnitude. Norm of... Correct. Norm, length, it's all the same. It's called norm, length. Right? So, so you have d1 vector, you have d2 vector. It's d1 vector by length of d1 vector into d2 vector by, again, this is not into, it's dot, by the way. Sorry. You got to be careful. It's not into, it's a dot product. All right? So d2 vector by modulus of d2, which is the length of d2. What is this called? Unit, 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 unit. unit vector, correct? So it's unit vector of d1 into unit vector of d2. Take the dot product. That's cos theta, okay? So let's do this mathematically. We'll keep it in two dimensions so that it's easy for us. Let's calculate it, okay? So let's say, same thing. So D1 is, I'm going to, this is all old, uh, this stuff, you know, typical vector algebra. Uh, just to explain the idea, folks, okay? So let's say, this is one unit, one unit. So can I write it as, and this is I, this is J, or X, Y, whatever you want to call it. So can I write it as I cap plus J cap? Can I do that, folks? D1, this is D1 vector. Can I write it as I cap plus J cap? Yes, we see. Right. D2 is twice. This is 2, this is again 2. Can I write D2 vector as 2i cap plus 2j cap? Can I do that? Yes, Can please. I? Right, okay. Now let's calculate the norm of D1. What is the norm of D1? It's the length, right? Root 2. Root 2. Why? 1, 1. So basically, it's a it's a right angle triangle. Or another way to do it is take the coefficients squared of 1 square plus 1 square. The coefficient is 1 here, 1 here. Correct? So this is root of 2. Norm of D2, folks? Root 8. Yeah, so 2 square, 2 square, right? 2 square plus 2 square, root of 8. All right, which is nothing but 2 root 2, correct? Sorry. All right, so this is root 2, this is 2 root 2. Now, <coughs> let's calculate d1 vector by modulus of d1 into d2 vector by modulus of d2. So how are you going to do that? So i plus j by root 2, correct? Dot product 2i plus 2j by 2 root 2. Now, what will this be? Can you just multiply and tell me? Calculate the dot product, folks. 1. Okay, how is it 1? Tell me. Okay, so... <clears throat> uh... 
first i cancel the 2 in the 2i plus 2j okay that stuff. then then so i took the root 2 denominator i first multiplied root 2 into root 2 that's 2 and <laughs> i dot so, i is 1 okay so you you like start with this right take this multiplied by this take this multiplied by this that's a dot product correct yeah so we what i i dot i is 1 1 and root 2 into root 2 is 2 1 by 2 plus 1 by 2 1 2 is 1 correct so what is cos theta now cos theta is 1 0 therefore theta is 0 theta is 0 all right now what i've done here is basically i was just trying to prove using our simple school mathematics that if i were to represent the document as a two dimensional vector and if i were to calculate the dot product of the unit vectors then i can figure out uh, you know if i can basically figure out the the angle so question so if so if i have a document okay just just remember this so let me ask a question in terms of how we're going to sort so let's say i have documents say d1 d2 d3 and d4 and i have a query q now what am i doing i'm calculating let's say cosine of q comma d1 cosine of q comma d2 cosine of q comma d3 and cosine of q comma d4 and let's say this value is 0.4 this is 1 this is 0.7 this is 0.84 so <coughs> your search engine has figured out uh we will we'll come to how we calculate this a little later we'll have a proper problem to solve this but let me ask a question so this is like saying look i have a query which is already a vector i'll tell you how to do that a little later in the next session so let's say i've already figured out i've already vectorized my query so a query is a bunch of words and i can put that as a vector remember right because any document can be a vector so a query can also be a vector correct so i have a vector <coughs> which is the query itself then i have this document you know bunch of these documents d1 d2 d3 d4 then i calculate the cosine so for example let's say can somebody tell me how will where will d2 figure this is the query vector look at this and tell me how will d2 look along the exactly along this is how d2 look why because cos is 1 so which means the angle between q and d2 is 0 so let us say hypothetically this were to be 0 can somebody tell me how would d1 look 90 degree 90 degree so it will be 90 degree something like this correct if this is the query then d1 would look 90 degree or perpendicular to uh q right so so the idea is you calculate the cosines and now given these cosines and i have supplied the query q now i want to sort or rank these documents so i've done the uh, so i have a query the query is treated as a document as i said we'll we'll do a problem to see how that happens okay how we convert the query into a document we will do that don't worry about it but let's say you manage to convert the query into a document and then 
So that's a vector. D1 is a vector. D2 is a vector. D3 is a vector. D4 is a vector. And we know a measure of similarity. Do we know the measure of similarity is a theta? If theta is zero, which means both vectors are aligned in the same direction, right? My question is, I want to sort my documents using this measure of similarity. So if I were to do that, which, tell me the sort order now. <laughs> so what's the first document that will throw up? D2. Right, D2 comes first. Then followed by? D4. D4. Then? D3. D1. D3. Sorry, D2, yeah, D3 and then D1, correct? D1. So basically what you do is we know that higher the cost value, so because we know cost zero is one, all right? Zero is, zero degree means vectors are in the same direction, right? And we know cost uh, 90 degree is uh, zero. So which means a vectors are perpendicular, which is 90 degree, then it's zero, right? So what you need to do is, all that you have to do is just sort it in descending order of cos theta. So in this case, this value is the highest. So which means D2 would come first, followed by D4, followed by D3, and finally, D1, <laughs> okay? Any questions here? I'm not going to <coughs> proceed further, but any questions so far? All right, so... So in summary, what we are doing is, basically, I'll, I'll just summarize this, and then we'll stop for the day. So you have a query. I convert that into a vector. I have documents. I convert them into vectors to D1, D2, say D3, D4. Then I calculate the cosine similarity of each one of them with respect to Q. It's all with respect to Q. So cos of QD1, cos of QD2, QD3, and QD4. And then I sort it in descending order. Of course, the question is, how do I calculate cost of, say, QD1, all right? So we know that is Q vector into D1 vector by So this is unit vector of Q, unit vector of D1. You take a dot product of these two. That's how you calculate the cost. Uh, we'll do an example where we we take a query and we calculate the unit vector. We can, we take a document, calculate the unit vector, and then do a dot product and calculate the cosine similarity. Okay. Uh, so this is the approach that we're going to take. Any questions, folks? All right, if there aren't any, uh, we'll stop for the day. Thank you for joining on a Friday evening. Good night, VC. Yeah, bye.